Nehemiah. We're we'll turning your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, or turning your, I guess you wouldn't turn your tablet, you would just flick your tablet over to Nehemiah, your phone. That's going to be a hard transition for me, just so you know. There'll, there'll eventually be a time where you won't hear people turning their, in their Bibles to, to things. So, Sad day, single tear, okay. So Nehemiah, Nehemiah, what do we know about, what do you know about Nehemiah? We're, we're fast forwarding a lot. We've, we've talked in here uh, our first night about Noah, right? Talked about Noah and the lessons we can learn from Noah. Talked about uh, the faith and the kind of faith that's the day-to-day, 100 years going to build something. Then we talked about Solomon and the Solomon asking for wisdom and, and leading the people and building that thing, uh, that temple and building a temple for God, and all the work that went into that. Now we're going to be building something else, which is sort of the theme. I think you're picking up on that. We're going to be talking about Nehemiah. When we talk about Nehemiah, what, are we, what is Nehemiah famous for building or helping to? Building a wall, exactly. A wall around Jerusalem, exactly. Now, we're fast-forwarding a lot into the future. Remember we talked about with Solomon. <clears throat> we read where God said to Solomon, if you and your sons follow after me, everything will be copacetic, and you'll have a king on the throne, that kind of stuff. But if you don't, I will take you away from this land. Remember we talked about that? Well, this is after they've been taken away from that land, okay? So it was a little bit, you know, God is saying, this is, uh, if you do this, this will happen, and it happened. So historically, uh, we have uh, two periods where they were kind of deported from, from Israel, uh, remember, after, after Solomon, you have the kingdom is divided. You have Rehoboam, his son, when he was asked to, to, um, to change the tax situation. Uh, he didn't say, read my lips, but he basically said, you know, the taxes are going to be heavier than when my father Solomon. And, and that kind of divided the kingdom. Like ten tribes to the north, which became known as Israel, and then two tribes to the south, which was known as Judah. And so after a period of Israel in, in the north never really had any good kings because they set up a false system of worship and they always followed that false system of worship uh, and they were taken into Assyrian captivity. And, uh, but Judah stayed for a, a period of a few more years. Uh, and then Judah eventually fell away also. After some reform by King Josiah, they still fell away and uh, they were taken into Babylonian captivity, so it's alphabetical. That's, that's nice for us to have Assyrian captivity, then Babylonian captivity. And while they were in captivity, the, uh, the Medo-Persians took over, uh, took over um, uh, Babylonia, conquered Babylonia, and so it kind of transitioned into, uh, into uh, Persian captivity, the Medo-Persians. Well, Jeremiah prophesied that they would return, that they'd be back in 70 years, and that there'd be a king that would come uh, named Cyrus. Isaiah uh, talked about that in Jeremiah. But, um, so when Cyrus came, came along, they showed him the prophecies, naming him as king, showing that he was going to be the one to allow them to go back. And so they begin to go back. And they begin to go back uh, in, uh, I believe it's about five, I have a piece of paper here somewhere. Um, about 530 B.C., uh, they begin to go back, and the first, first wave under Zerubbabel goes back, and then another wave goes back with Ezra, uh, and then now we're talking about Nehemiah. A group with Nehemiah goes back, so the third group that goes back, uh, goes back to, uh, to Jerusalem to kind of establish things. Zerubbabel goes back, and they help start building the temple, and Ezra goes back and helps with that, and they finish that, and then uh, Nehemiah comes, and we're building a wall. How many of you have a wall around your house? A wall? I mean, we have four walls, yeah. But, a, but not a fence, right? A privacy fence, chain link. Um, have you ever lived with a wall? We don't, really, we don't really think about walls being around or living in a fortified city, right? But what were some reasons why they would need fortifications around a city in that time? Protection, safety, enemies, 
when, the, when they go back, uh, when they go back uh, to Jerusalem, they're given all the instruments, all the, all the things that were kind of taken out of the temple, all the, uh, the golden vessels and the silver vessels and all that kind of stuff. That's all given to them to take back, uh, plus gold and that kind of stuff to rebuild the temple. There was, a, there was an offering that was given so they could rebuild the temple. And so they have, they're sitting on a pile of, of wealth. And so you got to protect that. And so, so there's a reasons why you want to, you know, rebuild fortifications uh, around, around a city. So Nehemiah opens up, and, and here's what he says in the first, or here's what happens in the first few verses. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakalai, uh, now it happened in the month of Chislev, which is about November or December uh, in the Jewish calendar. In the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital that Hananiah, uh, Hanai, uh, Hanai, one of my brothers and some of the men from Judah came and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates are burned with fire. So he, received, he asked how things are going and what do they say? What's the response? Great distress. Why? The walls are down. The gates are burned. Okay? That's not, not a good situation. Not a good situation for, for a city. There it is. <laughs> so here's the problem. Here's the situation. Now we're going to quickly learn something about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, as we go through this, this uh, narrative, Nehemiah is a man of prayer. And you're going to see that in his life. As you look here in verse 4, it says, When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the Lord God of heaven. And the rest of this chapter, chapter 1, 5 through the end, uh, is his prayer to God. It's his prayer to God. He begins praying to God. And so a problem is presented. A problem arises. He is mournful, he's sad, he's fasting. This affects him. The concern for the people that are there affects his well-being, and he prays to God. Can we relate to that at all? Is that a source for us? Uh, it needs to be a source for us. It needs to be something that we, we tap into. And so he prays to God, okay? And then chapter 2, we get, begin to see what's going on with him, and we begin to see kind of how this uh, story begins to unfold. And in chapter 2, and it came about... In the month of Nisan, which is actually a Syrian calendar, this is the Assyrian month, uh, and this is about March or April. So we went from November to December, and now in chapter two we're talking about you know springtime, March, April, and it's interesting. This this month for the Assyrians was sort of a month of happiness, and we're going to see why that's kind of contrasted, because Nehemiah is not in a happy situation, not in a happy state. And they came in the ninth month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of the king of uh, Artaxerxes. And the wine was before him, and I took the cup. And we we learn that he's what? What is he to the king at the end of chapter 1? He's a cupbearer. He makes sure the king has his his drink, and it's it's fine. It's not contaminated in any way. And I took the cup and gave it to the king. Uh, Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Uh, Why should my face not be sad when the city of the place of my father's tombs lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And the king said to me, what would you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven. Here again is prayer. I don't, know how, I don't know if you would respond in that way. Here's the king, the king, okay? Uh, a man of great authority, and he asked you, what would you request of me? What would you ask of me? Would you have thought ahead about that? He prayed. I doubt very seriously that he said, wait just a second, king, I'm going to say a prayer, okay? And then I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. I doubt very seriously it was that kind of prayer. In your mind, it may be, God help me, answer. Just a quick prayer. 
And those are powerful prayers also. Look in Matthew chapter 6. And we talk up talking about prayer. I'm going the wrong way with that. Matthew chapter 6. Does a prayer have to be long to be powerful? Do some people think otherwise? Yes. <laughs> it can be short. But what, what's the key ingredient in a prayer? Well, that helps. That's right. What about faith? Is faith important? That's right. You gotta, you gotta have faith. What about your heart? Does your heart have to be in it? Exactly. It needs to be sincere. Look at Matthew chapter six, verse five. Verse five. It says, "When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray." Go in your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is, in, uh, who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Uh, and he says in verse 7, when you, pray, when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So when we pray to God, we often need to have faith, we need to have a heart that's sincere, we need to know that before we even open our mouths, God knows what we need. He knew what Nehemiah needed in that moment. He knew what he needed. What happens after Nehemiah prays? Nehemiah prays in verse, uh, verse 4, so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and this begins, he has his prayer in verse 4, and he has his plan in, in his beginning in verse 5. I said to the king, if it please uh, the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, uh, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be, and will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I gave him a definite time. And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the provinces beyond the, the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I came to come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, uh, that I may give me timber to make beams for the gates and the fortresses, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house uh, to which I will go. And the king granted them to, be, uh, to me because the good hand of my God was on me. So when he prays, to God, what does he do next? He takes action, right? It sounds like he had a plan, doesn't it? What is he asking for when, when he talks to the king? He wants to go back to Judah. And he wants the materials, letters. That's right. You need to have these kind of documents in place. How many of us would have been like Johnny on the spot with that information? I don't know that I would have been. I don't know that I would have been. The king asked him, how long are you going to go and when are you going to come back? And he gave him that time. He gave him that information. And he, and he said, I want this, these letters. And so here he is. He's praying, but he has a plan. Do we pray that way? Do you pray that way? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm getting at? Do you pray for help? Do you pray that God will move and, and work in your life? And then do you take action towards those ends? Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, we, 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 we're like that. We just, you know, uh, there's a story, it's sort of, you know, a satire. This, uh, the, this flood comes, and this guy's on the roof, right? And he's praying to God, God save me, God save me. And the, boat, the guy in the boat comes by and says, hey, you want to come with me? He said, nope, God's going to save me, thanks. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit later, another guy comes by and says, hey, come on, you know, the water's getting higher, let's go, your house is about to be, you know, taken away. And he said, nope, God's going to save me. 
eventually dies, talks to God. He's like, man, God, where were you? And he said, I tried twice, you know. Uh, and so we need, to be, we need to be aware that we need to take action also with our prayers. We don't just pray and do nothing. Uh, faith, remember we talked about last time, faith plus verb. We need to have faith and we need to be able to people of action. Now, we also be, need to be part of our prayers. I don't know if you prayed this before, but Lord, shut doors. Have you prayed that way? Have you ever prayed about something and you have options before you? I talked to a brother recently, and he had several job opportunities lined up for him, and he wasn't sure which one to choose. Um, I've been praying, thank you, Lord, for as many options, but shut doors in the way that I don't need to go. And so we need to be people who, who are praying in that way and praying and, and take action. And, and Nehemiah does that here. He has a plan in place. He's ready to go. Uh, and so when the opportunity strikes, he goes. The king gives him this permission, and he goes. Uh, and so here is... Uh, another element in the story, beginning in verse, uh, verse 10. So in verse 9, Nehemiah goes over there. And verse 10, when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, official heard about it, about Nehemiah being there, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. When you're trying to do good, is there ever opposition? It happens, right? <clears throat> I know a guy who um, was married, and, and then he decided that he was going to go back and start doing things the way he needed to do, what he knew he needed to do, and start take, taking his children to, to church, and start doing those things like he needed to do. And his wife, all of a sudden, became a child of the, of the, of the devil and was completely against him going to church. And taking the children. There's opposition there. There wasn't any kind of opposition before, but as soon as the children were getting involved, as soon as those good things were happening, there was opposition. And sometimes that happens in our lives, where we decide to make change and do good, and we're going to have opposition. Did Christ have opposition? Yes. Did the first century church have opposition? The apostles have opposition? Yes. Will there always be opposition to good? Yes. But who's going to win in the end? God's in charge, right? God is in charge. And we have already been promised victory. And it's interesting. Uh, well, well, we'll talk more about this in just a second as, as his perspective and going, what's going on. And so here are here people, Sam Ballard, uh, and and Tobiah, be, begin to be the opposition. And it seems as though they're the ones that are taking advantage of the wall being down. The text doesn't say that exactly, but it seems to be that they're the ones taking advantage of their being, you know, the walls being down. Okay? Uh, and so we go on to chapter 3 and they begin to build. Well, actually, chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, he goes over and he inspects the wall. Nehemiah comes over. He doesn't tell everybody exactly what he's going to do, but he begins to go around the wall and inspect it. And then in, at the end of chapter 2, uh, in verse 17, he says, Then I said to them, and he's gathered all the nobles and everybody together, he says, Then I said to them, You see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And they said, Let us arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. Verse 19, but when Samballot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you're going to do? Opposition. And you're wondering why, right? As you read this text, why do they even care? Why do they even care? And that may be the same case in your, in your life. You, you're just bebopping along trying to do what's right, and people come along and mock you for it. Right? And you're like, why do you even care that I'm, why do you care that I'm doing good? And it's the same situation here. But I like what he's saying. Who does he give credit to in this text? God. He gives credit to God. He's made some pretty smart choices, Right? He's made some pretty smart choices, but he gives credit to God. 
The hand of my God is with me. The hand of my God is with me. Let us arise and build. And so this is, uh, you know, kind of one of those... Uh, do you all watch movies? I imagine you do. Uh, and so this is one of those moments when the hero comes to the people and says, we're going to do this. And all the people say, yes, huzzah, we'll do this. Okay? And so that's kind of what's happening right now at the end of chapter 2. Okay? Everybody's getting excited about the work. Nehemiah saying, God's with me. He's explained the situation. Even the king has said this is something that we need to do, and so they're excited about it. Because in the past, the king has said, no, you don't need to do this. They've had issues with that uh, in the past, in the, in, other, in the building project of the temple. And so now they're, they're excited about this. And so the voice of opposition rears its head again and begins to mock them. And they'll see that throughout this story as they begin to be mocked. Chapter 3 is them working. And it's interesting as you read through chapter 3 and just skim over it, it's, skim over it, it talks about the sons of this guy worked in this section, and the sons of this guy worked from this tower to this tower. And these people worked right in front of their house. Down in verse 23, it says, After them, Benjamin and his Hashab carried up repairs in front of their house. And then verse, uh, at the end of that, After them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, I can't read these names very well, and son of Ananiah, carried out repairs beside his house. So they're rebuilding this wall and they're actually rebuilding it in sections, in family units, along the wall. So when you talk about the sons of somebody, that means that family is working from this tower to that tower, or from this section to that section. And they're rebuilding it right in front of their house. Um, have you all ever worked on a project with a group of people before? A big, you know, big laboring project? Have you ever done it with your family? Some of you are like, man, that may not, may not be a good idea. <laughs> To do that as a family, um, there, there's a certain camaraderie that's there, I think more so with families. I remember we went to my aunt's house, and she was having a cabin built, and we helped lay the cement and helped cut timbers and, and raise, uh, raise their house and get it built for them. And, you know, I was a kid. I was just doing what little things I could do. But it was, it was something about the camaraderie there of us building something that was for the family. And here they are building this wall. It was very real for them. This was very real. If you look over in verse four, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, it says, And I stationed the people and families with their swords. And so it's going to get even more serious. And so he, he stationed them in family groups along the wall. That's a lesson for us as families working together, Right? There's a job to do. God's hand is with us. We pray to God about the work. We work together as a family unit. And we complete the task. Despite the opposition. Despite people mocking us. Despite what people are saying. So chapter 3, we begin to see how they're divided out. Okay? And in chapter 4, again, opposition comes. Uh, if you look in chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 2... Would somebody read uh, chapter 4, verses two, 2 and 3 for us, loud, loudly, please? Chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. All right, so what's being said here by Sam Ballot and Tobiah? They're calling them out, right? What's that? They're trying to undermine them. They're trying to undermine what they're, what they're, what they're there to do. And they're basically in the back just yelling at them and, and saying, are you really going to be able to build this wall? 
It's interesting that they say here about, because they had to, a lot of this wasn't, I don't want us to get the, get the idea of what's happening here. And if you want to go ahead and put the picture up of the, of the wall, that'd be great. I don't know if you can see that there. That's, that's the wall that Nehemiah was building. And uh, in this wall, there are, uh, I think, was it 34 towers, eight gates. It's a big wall. Uh, as they're building this wall, they're actually, they're not, they're not building it from zero, from scratch. Okay, they're not digging down the foundations. They're actually rebuilding the wall that's existing there. And so what a lot of things they're doing is they're taking the stones out of the rubble, rubble and reshaping them and putting them in place. And some of this stone, you know, I don't know if you knew, lime, limestone will actually burn. Some stone will actually burn. And so some of that was completely useless. So they would have to quarry some or do different types of, uh, of fill type type of work. And so this is what they're saying. And they're saying that the, the quality of the work is such that even a fox could, uh, could knock it down. I know you might need your binoculars for that. Uh, but even a fox could tear that down. Okay? A fox isn't a big animal, is it? No. It's, it's even cute sometimes, right? Uh, and so, you know, a fox can tear this down. And so, chap- verse 4 of, of chapter 4, what do we have here? What, is, what does Nehemiah begin to do again? Pray. He begins to pray. We're picking up on this theme with Nehemiah, right? Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. And do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before, before you, for they have demoralized the builders. At this point in verse 6, so we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And this is the key verse in this book. The people had a mind to work. And when people are going to work, and when they have set their minds to it, there's nothing that's going to stop them. Just so you know, the wall that they're building is about two and a half miles long, about 40 feet high, and about an average of eight feet thick. This was no small feat. And at this point, they built it up to half its height, 20 feet. But they begin to be demoralized. But the people had a mind to work. Have you ever tried to teach somebody something and give them all the right information and educate them on something and then they just do nothing with it? Nothing happens. Why is that? Because they don't care. They don't, they don't have a mind to work, right? You can literally give, if, in this situation, if, if Nehemiah came to them and said, I have all the letters, I have all the permission we need, we have the timbers we need, we have the people here we need, let's do this. And if they had said, nah, we're good, what would have happened? Nothing. Nothing would have happened. So even in the situation where you have all the resources available, if the mind is not willing to work, if people aren't willing to work, nothing's going to happen. A church can have all the programs that are, the, that are available, and you can have a youth group, and you can have classes for kids, and you can have classes for adults, and you have things for marriage and that kind of stuff, but if people don't show up, nothing happens. <laughs> right? You can have all kinds of programs, you can do this, but if nobody's there, nothing happens. It's a human element, right? That's the human element. It can rise and fall if, depending on us being involved in it. The people had a mind to work. This is, a key, this is key for this wall being built. Now, they began to, to get kind of aggressive and they said they're going to come and fight against them and actually take aggression against, against these. They're not going to just sit back and mock them anymore because that's not working because the wall is still going on. And so they get, um, they get to the point where they're going to take up swords against them. In verse 9 he says, But we prayed to our God again. Because of them we set up guard against them day and night. Uh, and the people are saying in verse 11, And our enemy said, They will not know or see until we come in among them and kill them and put a stop to the work 
And when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, by the way, they were told ten times that they were going to come in and kill him. I think once is enough, right? But, you know, ten times. Hey, they're going to come kill you. They're going to come kill you. They will come up against us from every place where you may turn. And then I stationed the men in the lowest parts of the, of the space behind the wall and exposed places, and I stationed the people and family group, families with their swords, spears, and bows. And when I saw their fear, have you seen fear in somebody before? Maybe somebody's seen it in you. <laughs> <laughs> but have you seen fear in somebody? Fear can really, really put a stop to things. What does he say here? When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember who? Remember me? I'm the guy with you? No. What does he say? Remember the Lord. And what does he say about the Lord in this text, in this verse? Who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord that brought us out of Egypt. Remember the Lord that gave us this great land. Remember the Lord who's done these great things for us. Remember the Lord who's brought us back. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for who? For your family, for your brothers, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your houses. Fight for everything that you hold dear. It's kind of serious, wasn't it? This is, a, you know, this is almost like a Braveheart kind of situation. This is a very serious thing. You're getting, you're getting the imagery there, right? You're getting the imagery, okay? You understand what's going on here. This is a call to arms. This is a call to arms. The enemy's up the ante. They're going to come against us with swords, and we're going to fight back, and we're going to defend what's ours. And we're going to fight for our families, and we're going to fight for what's good, and we're going to fight for everything that's precious to us, because this needs to be done. Is there any kind of application to that in our daily lives? Are we fighting for anything right now? Are we fighting a, a physical battle right now? A spiritual battle, right? We're fighting a spiritual battle. What does Ephesians tell us about our spiritual battle? Look over at Ephesians. Go ahead. Against, yes, against spiritual wickedness and wickedness in high places. Look over at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand and firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of, of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand, able to resist in the evil day. And it begins to go on talking about the different types of different parts of this armor. So are we fighting for anything right now? If you're kind of just not really awake to the battle scene, and you're just kind of ah, ho-humming through a battle, battle scene, are you prepared and you probably won't make it, right? We've all seen, you know, war movies. And there's a guy that is completely unprepared for what he's about to go into, right? And he's the guy that just doesn't make it to the end of the credits, right? Are you prepared for what's going on around you right now? And are you fighting for your family and for all you hold dear? Are you fighting for your household? Are you saying, Satan, this far and no more? Are you fighting for your brothers and sisters? Do you see the, the, the analogy that's there with Nehemiah? For them, it was physical. They began to build the wall to do the work that God had given them and have a sword and spear and shield in their hand at the same time. 
They didn't even put the shield down or the sword down when they went to get water. They had it with them at all times. In the military, when, when, when somebody is in a foreign field and on base, they have a firearm with them at all times. At all times. They are always ready. Because it's very real. And they talk about going beyond the wire. And when you go beyond the wire, your head's on straight. And you're ready. Because you don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of us, as Christians, we walk beyond that wire and have no clue what's going on. Like it's a stroll in the park. And we're not ready. Yes, ma'am. That is right. We are supposed to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. These people in Nehemiah's time, they were ready. They got ready. It got very real. Um, If you skip over to chapter 6. Chapter 6, the enemy tries some different things, some different tactics. They begin to say to Nehemiah, Hey, why don't you come down to this plain, the plain of Ono, and, uh, and let's talk about this. And he knew it was a trick. He knew it was a trick. And he doesn't go down there. So you don't go down to the plain of Ono. Okay? Uh, and then they begin to say, Well, well everybody's saying that you're, you're setting yourself up to be king, and you're fighting against the other king in, in Persia. And he says, no, that's not what's happening. And so they, find, they try and do other tactics to try and dissuade them. But in verse 15, what does it say? So the wall was completed on the 25th of the month of Elul in 52 days. In 52 days, they make a wall that is two and a half miles long, 40 feet high, and about, upon average about eight feet thick. I don't know if in 52 days I would be able to put anything up really of, of note in 52 days, right? 52 days comes along, Josh, how's your wall? Um, come back and check on me in another 52 days, right? 52 days. Look in verse 16. When all our enemies heard of it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence. For they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Was it them by themselves? No. Did they have to be plugged in? Did they have to have a mind to work? Yes. But at every turn they're praying to their God. At every turn they're saying God's hand is with us. At every turn they're confident and they're faithful in what's going to happen. And God helped them. You don't build a wall that big in 52 days and there'll be some providential watch care over what's, being, what's happening, right? Because one oops, and you're starting over in, in certain aspects, right? One mismeasurement. Have you ever measured something and cut it and you realize you cut it about, you know, considerably too short? <laughs> yeah. So in things like that, you could really throw, throw some work off. But they were able to do this in 52 days, despite the opposition, despite the fear, because they were prepared to do this work, to do this great thing. And it was very real for them. It was very real for them. This was in their face opposition. They were fighting for things that are precious for them. I think one of our greatest enemies is ease. Right? Complacency. Complacency. And that's actually one of the soldier's greatest enemies, is complacency. If we get in the habit of not having that, that ramped up, in-your-face situation, then it'll become easy. And we let our training slip. We let things kind of go by our way. Our discipline kind of sloughs off. And it's easy. Have you ever heard how to boil a frog? Have you heard that analogy before? One degree at a time? And that's sort of where we are right now, I think, personally. Uh, I'm guilty of that very same thing. 
it's just easy to float along into our, in our daily routines. How many of you have a schedule for your day? You get up a certain time, you go through this. Some of you are laughing like, oh, schedule, what? Uh, but we go, through our, we go through our lives, and we're very scheduled. This is what we do, and da, 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 and you go through this. And at what point do we realize and lift up our heads that, that we're working in a situation or we're operating a situation where we need to be ready for Satan coming at us and kind of chipping away? And Satan's not going to come at us today, you know, full frontal attack, assault, uh, like exorcist kind of thing, right? Satan's really not going to come at us like that. Satan's going to come in the, the back door, this, the, this, the easy things. Those things where we said, well, that's not that bad. A month later, oh, this isn't that bad. And where are we a year later? Way in a situation we never thought we were going to be in. We're way off course. Um, if you've ever tried to Sailors in here, any sailors? Anybody navigated before? Transatlantic navigation? Is one degree that important in, 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 in one mile or two miles? One degree in two miles isn't that big a deal. But one degree in 2,000 miles? That's, that's a huge, huge deal, right? You may miss a whole continent uh, in, in that situation. How about one degree in a day. I'm, I'm just one degree off, one degree off bubble today. Yeah, I can live with that. But what if I'm one degree off in a lifetime? Where, where are we at that point? Some of us may be a half, half a bubble off plum as it is, but uh, in, in talking about our life, are we, are we prepared? And do we think that way? Do we, do we think about life being that battle and us fighting for our children, fighting for our brothers? And it, it doesn't seem that way, right? It doesn't seem in the day-to-day -day life we don't see that imagery. But sometimes we need to wake up and realize that this life is a spiritual battle and that we need to be prepared and that we need to be preparing each other and helping with that. What are some, ways we can, what are some things we can do to prepare how do we prepare? This will be the discussion part of class. Study the Bible. And the Study, the Bible. Study the Bible. What is the Bible? Look, up, look over at Ephesians again. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. What is the Bible called in this text? Ephesians chapter 6. It's our armor, right? I'm trying to find the exact verse. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's verse 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How many of you know how to handle a sword? Like legitimately? <laughs> Video games don't count. How many of you practiced with a sword? I haven't. It'd be really cool to, but I haven't. So it's not a skill that's kind of needed, right, today. Um, are, they, are, are swords known to be light? Okay, I'm not talking about fencing. Fencing is not really a sword, just to get it out there. Fencing is not really sword play. It's just, you know, tag with long metal sticks, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about, like, hand-and-a-half swords, like medieval swords and Roman swords and those kind of things. They're, they're on average, three-and-a-half, four pounds, depending You've, it, depending on what, it's more. They, they are up to eight pounds. Well, but, it depends on the gauge here. Well, katana, no, that's right out. We're not talking about katanas. Okay. They're heavy. You got to practice with them. You got to learn, you got to use some muscles. Have you ever done something, an exercise, and all of a sudden, whoa, I didn't even know I had muscles there, Right? Are we practicing with our sword? Are we ready? If you look at the list of, of things that are listed here, how many of these are offensive weapons? And how many of them are defensive? You have to keep it sharp. You've got to know how to use it. The Romans actually uh, would, had a practice of 
of taking a stick and rubbing it in their hands like this to build up calluses in their hands. Why would calluses be important if you're sword fighting? So you don't get blisters. Oh, pause, time out, I got a blister. Got to put a Band-Aid on it. No, you can't do that in, in, when you're fighting, right? You can't do that. You got to be prepared. Take every advantage. And we need to be doing the same thing in our lives, being prepared. Are we ready to handle the Word of God? When Peter handles a sword on, on the mount in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, what, ha- what does he do with that sword? He cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest, right? Do you think he was aiming for his ear? Nope. Probably not, right? So we know that Peter was a fisherman. He was not a samurai. Uh, and so, you know, he was not practiced. He was not skilled in the use of the sword. Um, are we skilled in, in our use of the word of God? What are some other things that are mentioned here? Stand firm having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So we need a belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the pre- uh, preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all the, uh, taking up the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Do you see the armory that's, that's, that's taking place? You need a belt, you need a breastplate of righteousness. You need these things. You need your shield of faith. Does your, does your shield have holes in it? How flimsy is your shield? Or how sturdy is your shield? What are we asking? How's your faith? Isn't that what we're asking? So we begin to see the importance of being prepared and being ready for the battle that's before us. Nehemiah, when they were building this wall, They had no idea that this kind of opposition was going to take place. I I don't imagine that Nehemiah knew, oh, by the way, we're probably going to have this kind of opposition. But when they did, they were ready. What was a key element in in them being able able to do this work? God was with them. They had the, the, the resources available. What was a key element in them being able to do this? The people were willing to work. You can do anything when people are willing to work. Now your family. Let's break this down. Let's get real in our, in our daily lives. Where's your family? Are you willing to work as a family unit on your section of the wall? Are you willing to work? Is your family prepared? Is your family doing the work? And is your family preparing them, each other, helping each other, building each other up to, to do that good work? And is God working in your life? These are some questions that we need to ask ourselves as we go from here tonight, where are we? Take stock on where are we as a family? Where are our priorities? Are priorities a big deal? Yeah, a bit. If I just had more time. If I just had more time. Have you ever thought that? Even if we had more time, if our priorities aren't in the right place, we, we're not going to use it the right way, right? Priorities are huge. We need to make sure that our, as a family our priorities are in place and that we're focused on heaven and that we're all striving to get there. I want to leave you with this thought uh, and then it'll be almost cookie time. Um, which, by the way, if you knock on the door and ask for the, the, the brownies, there's brownies too. There's some people that are hoarding them in the back. So. But don't let the kids know about it. Um, I'm going to leave you with this thought. If we're working together as a family, I know that as families we travel sometimes and we separate. Uh, we go our different ways. Kids are about to go off to, grad- to, to college. School years are going to start and that kind of stuff. Say this to each other when you separate. Live in such a way that if I don't see you on earth again, I'll see you in heaven. And keep your focus on heaven as a family, being prepared, and we're all working towards that goal.